stage. I got it. Okay. Looks like we're Good on. morning, Revolution, and welcome. Good morning, to Good morning Revolution. Revolution. <laughs> Good morning, Revolution. Anita, Scott. Well, Rosanna's on vacation this weekend, and as is Michael, so it's just the three of us. There was a song that weren't just the two of us. I don't know if you <laughs> remember that one. I won't try to sing it because I'm, you know, I don't want to scare people That's away. <laughs> yeah, people are joining the party right now. Let's not, let's not. Yeah. Ask I was in a play once, and and the character had to sing a song. So the director said, "Why don't you try and just sing a few bars?" Uh, I got like three words out of my mouth. He said, "No, stop, stop. Why don't you just recite the poem?" <laughs> I felt so bad. I mean, you know, some people just, if you got it, you got it. If you don't, you don't. Well, uh, today is the day after the uh, anniversary of uh, the January 6th uh, coup efforts, insurrection, riot. People are calling it uh, different things. Uh, does anybody remember what you were doing when you heard about the, uh, where you, um, I guess it was, well, it was January, so you must have been inside. Anita Scott, do you recall what I, you were doing I, when you? I was sitting in exactly the same place as I'm sitting right now at my computer, you know. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I, I was following it through streaming I, because I don't have TV, actually. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was shocking. It was just uh, uh, really riveting news all day long. Um, amazing. What about you, Scott? Uh I, I wasn't following it uh, streaming. I, I kept checking the headlines um, with just this growing kind of um, terror, I guess, uh, because, you know, we had talked about the fascist threat and, and intellectually understood it and this and that, but, but it's different, you know, seeing firsthand how, well, not firsthand, but close enough hand, how well organized the, the fascist forces are. Um, how close they came to actually disrupt, actually, you know, not certifying the election. Uh, and yeah, I, I, like it's it's more than knocking at the door. It's, it's you know, it's got a foot and an arm through the gate. Uh, and the other thing was just seeing, you know, how unprepared the sort of usual, bourgeois democratic, liberal democratic um, both system and ideology were with, you know, understanding with it and, and responding to it. Because um, right away, the first thing was, oh, this is a, these are, this is Trump's base, this is Trump supporters, whatever, whatever, um, just totally making it into a, an ideological question about, you know, are you an extreme, are you, you know, do you support Trump or not, instead of seeing it in the correct class terms, looking for the, the donors and the organizers. And um, I think people are coming around to that a little bit, but it was, yeah, it was a- Well, we're gonna come back to that issue of who supported in, in just a minute. I remember I was at the office and um, really kind of, well, not sitting in the same place I'm sitting now, so. <laughs> It snowed yet last night, by the way. We got our first snowstorm uh, uh, in New York. Um, so I decided to wait until they cleared the streets. I didn't want to get stuck on the highway like in Virginia. They got stuck the other day. <laughs> but you got to expect that in D.C. They never prepare for snow. Anyway, so I was at the office, and I, I, I watched uh, Trump's speech. You know, and I was okay. I saw the, I was like, yeah, bigger than I thought it was gonna be. The crowds, you know, and all of that. And and they were in a tent, Trump and the Donald Jr. and his partner, and they were all toasting and each other and everything. And then I was talking, I called John Bactel to talk to him about something. And we were watching, and he, he was like, oh, shit, they went into, what's going on here? They break. And at first I thought it was, well, you know how sometimes, I've been in demonstrations where you're going to occupy a 
when I was in college, we occupied the Board of Trustees meeting, turned it out. We were protesting different things. Um, South Africa, apartheid, and raising the tuition. So I figured that I didn't pay. But then, the, the, as it went on, it became clear to Mickey that this was something they were trying to stop the uh, vote from taking place, you see. And, um, but then I was like, something's wrong here because um, if they were trying to stop the vote, and I, and I kept wondering, uh, were there other detachments that were still coming? You know, and, and, and what was the, and then they were reporting about the woman who got killed. What was her name? Um, Ashley and, Babbitt. Babbitt, Babbitt, yeah. Oh, she, they were trying to break through the door and, and, uh, and then as the day went on, it became clear what, what was, what was, uh, what was happening. Um, so did anybody listen to the speech of the vice president and the president yesterday? Lisa? Yes, I, I did. I listened to those speeches as well as some of the other members of Congress. Um, there was some uh, uh, historians panel discussion of the event. Um, so, and then I also uh, availed myself of the Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, news analysis, uh, news conference, which was, I guess, supposed to take the place of the Trump con news conference that he canceled mm. at the last minute. And that was really uh, just uh, eye opening too, um, just at uh, the degree to which they are, you know, the, the stretches they're going to to spin this story in, in a way that does not, you know, that sheds no light on what really happened and really hides what what is the insurrection. Um, what after. story? According to parents, it was just a day in January. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God, the president is making their feelings known. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> God, the, 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 the president yesterday, um, uh, for the first time, directly went after Trump. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he took so long? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think he really wanted wanted. A, I mean, what he said was he hoped to move on, and and he and he started out as it um, with his inaugural address, promising bipartisanship and that kind of uh, thing. This this time he really um, was sort of like uh, couldn't couldn't go there anymore, fed up, and specifically said he would not work with Republicans who were uh, embracing the big lie. Um, so he, he really drew the line this time. Yeah, he, you know, that don't leave him much to work with. <laughs> yeah. right. Why do you think he waited so long? Uh, I, I agree with Anita. I think he, um, I think he had this vision, maybe, maybe not a realistic one uh, of, you know, bringing in uh, a section of um, you know, conservatives, former Trump voters, whatever, um, of, of, you know, this sense of, of, of a country that wants to be united. Um, but, you know, if, if, I mean, it's, it's clear, and I guess it finally became clear to him that there is no moving on uh, beyond Trump until we take care of, of the fascist threat until we take care of this problem. Wait, man, wait, 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 hold up, y'all. I'm confused. This is a man who sat at Barack Obama's side for eight years and witnessed cold-blooded 24-7 GOP obstructionism. And he was there when Mitch McConnell said, we ain't going to give these people a, a inch. We're going to block everything that he did. Why would he think that he, Anita? Well, I mean, <laughs> Is it true I, that he's old and senile and he don't remember what <laughs> happened or what? No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't think that's the problem. Not that he isn't old, but I, I think his he has his wits about him, and I think that really showed through in the speech uh, yesterday. But I guess he did hope for the best and and hope that I think. I mean, he knows that the Senate is fifty fifty, 
And he knew in order to get anything past the Senate, he needed that those extra votes or, you know, if, if bipartisanship was possible. Um, but I, I, I'm sure he's seen that that's not possible and I'm sure he's gonna keep on um, this, you know, approach uh, in coming, coming up to the midterm, uh, the midterm elections. Why do people keep that, saying bipartisanship is not possible? I, I don't understand. They just voted to expand the military budget. Well, and that's and, the, and, huh? That, that's the thing. Um, you know, th the other part of this, you know, fetishism of, of bipartisanship and, and unity is that there's a substantial section of the ruling class whose interests are best served with a very sort of equal split of power in Congress, um, you know, where a couple of votes can sway it either way, where you can't make, you know, uh, where, the, where the, the extreme right is kept on a chain, uh, but where the left is, you know, kept out of the, uh, kept out of the spotlight. Um, and that I think fundamentally is where, is where Biden lives in that. If there wasn't a couple of votes, half the freaking Democratic caucus, they split right down the middle. And half of them voted with the uh, uh, complete uh, lockstep vote by the GOP to raise the military above and beyond I mean, they, what the I don't Obama think administration characterize it as a, I mean, it was a uh, lockstep vote for the GOP, but at the same time, that's just, I mean, the question of, of militarism and imperialism is one that unites the entirety of the ruling class, you know, without, um, I, I'd venture to say without exception. Um, and what became clear was that there's, you know, what part of the Democratic Party is uh, still unwilling to question that and what part um, is moving beyond it. And I'm, I was heartened that half of the Democratic caucus uh, voted against Yeah, it. it was good. People keep saying, oh, the Democrats voted lockstep. No, they didn't. I mean, I'm not no fan of, <laughs> they, they didn't, I mean, it, half of them said, no, we're not going for that. But the other half, I mean, so if you support imperialism, if you support the military buildup, if you support the rich, then you're likely needed to have a whole heap of bipartisanship. <laughs> but if it supports the people and the working class and black folk and Latinos and women, women they don't want to hear nothing about that. Mm -hmm. And you can see the the influence of those weapons manufacturers, for example, who are who are dependent on Congress's goodwill. And uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, they're they right after January sixth, they said they're not going to support those senators or Congress people who really started the insurrection before it started by um, claiming that they weren't going to certify the election. And they said right after the uh, insurrection that they wouldn't give them any more money, but they have, they've just given them hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, they the went table, back on right? that immediately. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. Under the table, huh? they were, they were. Well, <laughs> it's. I can't do it completely under the table. Maybe they wanted to, but you know, those contributions are public. About Biden's speech and about these proclamations of democracy, you know, which he also makes in, um, you know, in, in reference to the program of, of aggression against China, you, you can't have democracy at home and, you know, imperialism abroad. Um, it's just, it doesn't stand because even as Anita pointed out, these weapons manufacturers are some of the ones funding the very forces that are, uh, are, are most opposed to um, democratic reforms here. So it, it's not just a question of being consistent in your ideology. It's a material question of you have to, you have to break with that, with that system and with that well, we, we are talking about bourgeois democracy. I mean, it is, mm -hmm. I mean, there are different kinds of democracy, you know, and somebody say we should shell bourgeois democracy. You should stop talking about it. I mean, have you lost your mind? You look like completely, you know, just gone over to 
the other side of the picket line. How can you not talk about capitalism? We, don't, we live under capitalism. And it's because we live under capitalism that the right wing is hijacking the Build Back Better program mm -hmm. and the center, centrist right. That's bourgeois democracy, for God's sake. But I, I get it. Okay. I mean, Go ahead. On, on the other hand, like, it's, you know, I think there's a lot of, there, there's a tendency sometimes to get uh, trapped within that framework of bourgeois democracy, to be unable to look or think beyond it. Um, you know, and we, what we recognize as, as Marxist Leninists is that um, the highest form of democracy is socialism. Well, communism eventually, but, but the next phase of democracy is socialism. Um, it, it's something that has to be built here and now on the terrain of bourgeois democracy, but that means the bourgeois part of that, the capitalist rule has to fall away. And, and you know, we're working for that. Uh, exactly, including the uh, legislation that's- that, Go oh, ahead. Including the legislation that's being proposed, the Fair Voting Act, Fair Freedom to Vote Act, and the John Lewis Voting Act, both of those things do increase, um, decrease the influence of money in politics. So, um, as well as protecting certain, uh, you know, abilities to write, to to vote and to stop gerrymandering on a partisan basis. There are different forms of bourgeois democracy. There's advanced democracy. The Portuguese talk about that. The Portuguese communists. We talk about anti-monopoly democracy in our program. Or at least we used to. I haven't read it. <laughs> oh. You know, where if, if you have, you know, different forms of uh, voting, uh, proportional representation, you know, Lonnie Guinea has several different cumulative voting and all those different kinds of things that she was proposing. Uh, and if that's combined with radical reforms of the economy where workers have more control over what they put, or what we produce, and I mean, before you have socialism, you could there there, there are deeper forms of, uh, but it's still bourgeois democracy until the workers rule. For sure, and and that's you know I keep going back to Lenin's two tactics. It's really my favorite, I think, um, uh, essay. Marxist What's that? I know what I'm gonna buy you for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point he makes is that even in the struggle for bourgeois democracy, the kind of bourgeois democracy you end up with depends on who's in the leadership of that struggle. You know, is it the is it the you know the liberal bourgeoisie leading the struggle against the the reactionary forces, or is it the work is the the energy and the priorities coming from the working class? Does the working class have the strength and organization to impose its priorities? Because then, yeah, you still get bourgeois democracy at the end, um, but it's a very different kind of bourgeois democracy, and it's much closer to socialism. Um, the bourgeois. Okay, well, I have a question. Was January six a white working class revolt? No. <laughs> I mean, that's I'm what they're saying. I'll let it Okay. Go ahead. What I mean, are you... Go on. Don't hesitate. Oh, I, I thought talking. it was I, Scott is stopped himself. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Don't pause too go. much. Come on. <laughs> say what you mean. Mean what you say. One there, of you. There is no. There is no. The, the idea of a like white working class as a political force is a. Uh, ridiculous idea from a Marxist perspective. There is a working class that is uh, multiracial, that is multinational, men and women, uh, gay and straight. This idea that there's like, um, that the working class, the sort of main component of it is, is like blue collar white men from the country is, is ridiculous. And, and furthering that idea by talking about the white working class doesn't do us any favors. Uh, and demographically, we, we know that um, the people that attended January 6th um, and were the most active in it were uh, a lot of small business owners, maybe economically, you know, uh, struggling ones, but, but they weren't, um, it wasn't primarily a working class movement. And then when you get to the, the funders and the organizers of it, you know, then you're talking about people who are, you know, hundred millionaires, billionaires, that sort of stuff. 
That's right. Which is not a working I don't class. know, Anita. I mean, I, I know a guy who worked uh, in the Mahoning Valley, and he said that 40% of his union, or 50%, support Trump. I mean, well, they, yes. Uh, and I, they I, won I mean, my county. I know, I know, Joe, it's hard, but they're, um, yeah, I think, and I think Ohio, um, those areas of Ohio really participated in January 6th disproportionately. Um, if you go by the 700 and some uh, arrests that have been made so far, Ohio really stands out as one of the contributors to the, to the mischief on uh, the, or the mischief is too small, mild a word on January 6th. So, um, yeah, but it wasn't working class people. It was uh, that um, study by Robert Pate from uh, the political scientist um, analyzed those 700 some and found that really they're not working class people for the most part. As Scott said, small business owners were a big part of that. There was one um, that we could see in the videos that had his, his painting company. Uh, he's a small, <laughs> small business owner with a painting company. And actually he had his, uh, identifying shirt with a um and so he's he's in, he got arrested and charged well that was well. smart <laughs> right <laughs> it's no it's no secret that there's a section of the working class a, a substantial one that that has come under the influence of of fascism through uh white supremacy through um just the the constant propaganda pounding hammering by the you know by the by the right, um, but that's not, for us, it's not an option to simply sort of write that off. Um, we know that socialism is the solution. We know we can't get there without a united working class. Um, so I'm not saying that, you know, the, the priority right now is, is going after Trump voters and, you know, convincing them to, you know, swing to Marxism out of hatred of the establishment or whatever that, that's not a real thing, um, but we do need to keep, you know, keep our eyes on on what is necessary, which is um, breaking the influence of of the extreme right uh, and the, the fascist right on the ruling on the working class, rather. But we have to fight for the entire class. I mean, we're a part sure. of the working class, and the working class got black, white, Latino, Asian. Uh, differently gendered and uh, women and so on. We got to fight for the, including the backward section. I mean, that's what they, we've always had that, that's why we got to build the party. Because if there had been a consistent growth of the party in 50, 60, 70, we wouldn't be in this situation now. Because the only people who understood how to fight racism, you know, um, well, I'm not going to say we're the only people. I don't want to be that arrogant. But we would have among the best fighters for it because we understood it was on the basis of self-interest. Mm -hmm. You know, that that was the basis for unity. You couldn't build a union without doing that. But then we got driven out of the industries. I mean, literally, blackballed. I knew a guy who was a steel worker at Youngstown. He couldn't get a job in the whole state of Ohio. He had to move to LA. <laughs> mm. he, couldn't, he couldn't work anywhere. His name was Cal Jackson. And so, um, but oh my goodness. So Anita's point is that they were small business people, maybe some upper sections of the, you know, craft mm -hmm. workers, electricians, carpenters, you know, um, and a lot of business people who, who organized that thing. Let me ask you another question. The Republican Party, I posed a question in the National Board the other night. What is it? Is it a fascist party? Is it a neoconservative party? Is it an authoritarian party? What is it now? I mean, it's we, a have, we, we, we gotta understand what we're dealing with. In some ways it's, it's, a... Says it's a worker's party. <laughs> It's a cult Anita. of personality, Joe. I think it's got- It's a cult be, of personality party? It is, uh, the, for the most part. I think they're, they're, they know uh, many- Is that a uh, Marxist uh, definition? Uh, oh, I know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Frankfurt School de definition. That's what is it, well, 
Yes, I'm I know asking. there. Uh, uh, that that uh, I'm sorry. That concept that it's uh, that it. Um, I think um, we have to really analyze who who was there. And I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. But well, um, Marxist cult of personality is a is oh, a category. Cult of yeah, well, valid. they you the, have, the, you, you have uh, now, huh? The Republicans yeah, had as, as their uh, I don't know I don't know the origin of the cult of personality concept, but uh, they um, they adopted a platform in the last uh, Republican convention of anything Trump says was was what they wanted to do. So they don't even have a program, although they do have uh, they do have an agenda of uh, making people doubt their government and and doubt government uh, you know ability to solve problems. And they're really doing in, you know, enacting, they're keeping people from solving problems in Congress right now. So they're, um, and I think it's just convenient for them to have Trump as their uh, leader. He's a, an amazing fundraiser and they, they're dependent on his uh, ability to raise money and his endorsement um, for, for that reason. So I think it's really, still um, a personality driven uh, people, people around, um, you know, in, in the rural parts and in Youngstown area too, they just, um, they just adore Donald Trump personally. And I think probably uh, Scott's right about it's being rooted in white supremacy. And I would also say misogyny because it really came out of that 2016 election. Um, there, ain't, and, there ain't no question about that. White supremacy mm -hmm. and hatred of women, sexism. Right. Sexism, that's what we mean by misogyny. What is it, Scott? Is it a conservative party, neocon, fascist, I, I would think of it as, what is it? I would think of it as something like, um, it feels weird to talk about like a vanguard party of the ruling class. Uh, because they're re so a rear guard party of the ruling class. I don't know, um, but it's the it's the party that the force that most consistently, purely and thoroughly expresses the interests of uh, the capitalist class in their unadulterated form, with you know whatever tactics are necessary to uh, to impose them. Um, that's how I see it. Uh, the Democratic Party is a capitalist party as well. Don't get me wrong; um, it, it is under the still under the domination of a section of the ruling class. But the real uh, center of gravity, driving force, whatever you want to call it, of um, uh, of the ruling class's attempt to suppress democracy um, is the Republican Party. Um, and I would see it, in fact, what what the Communist Party is supposed to be to the working class. Uh, is what the Republican Party is to the ruling class right now. I think that we need to come up with an assessment of what the what just what's going on there. I mean, because it's clear that the major driving forces in the GOP are the extreme right, openly aligned with fascist groups. I mean, at least the dominance <clears throat> nationally, because but. That's not the case throughout the country, because if it was, Trump would be president, we wouldn't be in jail, and this show would not be taking place. Because what happened, what stopped them was what happened in the state GOPs, particularly in the battleground states, in Pennsylvania and uh, Michigan and Georgia, and so on and so forth. So there's still resistance to it uh, <clears throat> among- I would, I would, I would question that, Joe. Um, How could you question there, there, is, there is resistance to Trump. Obviously, there's a there's a no. understanding that his he's a destabilizing influence. That he was a a, a, a creature for a certain moment, um, and that he needs to be kind of shuffled off to the side. Um, on the other hand, uh, days after refusing to hand the election to Trump in Georgia, those same forces uh, were pushing for draconian voting rights restriction to allow the, the state GOP to throw out the votes of the people of Georgia. So those but are not- initially, But they said no, the governor said no, the secretary of state said no, the county uh, vote, I mean- Yeah, but, I mean, but then what You can the, do two things at the same time. Yeah. That's the nature I mean, of capitalism. I just, I, I'm saying they're resisting Trump, but they're not they're not well, resisting. That's what I'm saying. We're saying that. I'm saying fashion. that they're not fascist. 
they're not trumped there's, by there's, there's they a distinction. One of the members of the board made the point the other night that we need to come up with an understanding the distinction between the extreme right and fascism. You can't lump them all together, even though the, all of it's odious. Well, but fascism is the open terroristic dictatorship of the most reactionary sections of finance capital. And, so, and, and, and that's there. But the so governor of distinction. Georgia Sorry, I'll let Anita jump in. That I'm, definition, I'm, huh? I'll let Anita jump in before I... I why? I mean, I, 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 you were yeah. starting to say something, Scott, so carry on. Um, uh, I think the... I mean, so we have we yeah we can parse it out into the the extreme right, which you know I would call like the McConnell uh, end of things, Brett Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, that you know whatever tendency, um, and then the Trump uh, fascist forces with Gates and um, uh, Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene and that crowd lot element, um, but. I guess, and, and they're, um, they're working pretty tightly together. Uh, and I don't see what's left of the Republican party that Merritt's talking about besides that, aside from these few people who get constantly fetishized in the bourgeois media, oh, Liz Cheney, oh, you know, uh, the, the guy from the Adam something, right? Uh, but, but so th there's this tendency to, to focus on them as if they're like these heroic standouts. But does that represent, I mean, what are their politics, first of all? Aren't they just part of the extreme right and, and against Trump? So what, what's left of the Republican Party once you, outside of the extreme right and fascism? The, the ability uh, to make an assessment that's accurate, on the basis of concrete situations, really important. And we need to come up with an assessment of it because there are distinctions and there are contradictions between, and some of those distinctions, even though they may be small, may be the difference between whether or not you go to jail or not, Scott. Um, I'm not um, and, trusting and, anyone and, that you and that's really, out of jail. That's really, huh? I Let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to continue this discussion next week. <laughs> it's an important uh -huh. one. And in the National Committee. Let me ask you a question, Joe. If, 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 what if um, those folks, those senators and, and Congress people voted in on the 7th not to certify the election and, and there, there, was a, there was an auto golpe or whatever it is, the, the self-coup, and Trump installed himself as president, then would we have crossed over into fascism per se, would you say? We would, we, we would be very close to it because one of the things that Dimitrov said was that it would not be a usual transfer of power. Mm -hmm. That would have been an unusual transfer of, of power. Yet still so, a constitutional uh, one. I, huh? Yet still a constitutional one. The yeah. Constitution yeah. is very, very stretchy when it comes to the prerogatives of, of the powerful. Yeah. And they're making well, it more stretchy, you know, with these laws in, in state legislatures. Open terroristic dictatorship of the most reactionary sections of finance capital. And even in those situations, so long as you have vestiges of bourgeois democracy, so long you got to continue to fight within the space that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the mistakes that the party made during the McCarthy period. We went underground. We went and then we couldn't fight because everybody was underground. It was a big mistake. You know, even as the leadership's in jail, you know, Republicans dominated the Congress. And, uh, but there was still space, even though it was restricted. South Africans fought as long as they possibly could, and then they had to go abroad and form an army, spirit a nation. So, you know, uh, these are not small questions, and we're going to have to dig further into it. Well, we are way over time. <laughs> it was a good conversation. I like to argue. So, uh, it's all comradely. 
Next week, we have a program on Sunday. Michael Honey is going to speak on Dr. King. Go to cpusa.org and check it out. In the meantime, we'll see you next week. Stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Omicron is here. You know, don't take unnecessary risks. Right. And uh, so we love you and we need you. Take care. We'll be back with you next week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Good to see you.